Tinti, tinti. <laughs> individual, I would definitely create content for every day for every year i i better not we better not waste much time but concern for animals and an afterlife place for them and uh, i'm i'm specifically specifically referring to literary sources such as the prose edda but also uh, some of the surviving skaldic poetry <laughs> Hello my dear friends, how is it going? I'm Ari Therger and today I'm going to talk about the possibility of an afterlife notion for our beloved furry companions in relation to Scandinavian belief systems, mainly in relation to Old Norse societies of the late Iron Age and throughout the Viking period in the North. I'll be focusing on cats and dogs as such animals have been usually considered to be the main pets within the Western societies, so it is easier to find information concerning such animals. Now, you, you may be thinking, Arith, have you run out of ideas for a video? And the answer is, fortunately and unfortunately, I have a lot of ideas and I could honestly create content that would last 30 lifetimes and if it were humanly possible for a single individual i would definitely create content for every day for um, every year in all those 30 lifetimes alas i won't live that long so better not waste time and just go straight to the subject i'm doing this video uh, not only because it was a question posed by one of my patrons and it's perfectly understandable the um, the concern with our furry companions and uh, where they go to after they depart from this world but not from our hearts um, and uh, and also because I, I find this subject quite endearing and from this uh, there may be a new thing or two we can learn and perhaps appease the minds of those who love their little furry friends so with no more delay let's start our today's video my dear friends please was there ever the notion that cats and dogs would go to a special afterlife place in pre-Christian Scandinavian religious conceptions? The answer might seem obvious, but unfortunately, when Old Norse literature was written down, it was meant for a, mainly a Christian audience. And unlike pagan mentalities, during the Catholic period of Scandinavia, there was little concern for animals and an afterlife place for them. And I'm specifically, specifically referring to literary sources such as the Prose Edda, of course, but also some of the surviving skaldic poetry, skaldic poems, that um, clearly reveals content that was purposely created to perform within an Old Norse Christian court. In Christian religious understandings, animals have no soul. Therefore, an afterlife spe specific for them or a place in the other world where they could live alongside humans simply did not exist in the Christian religious mentality, especially during the Middle Ages. However, the Middle Ages were, let's say, infused with animal symbology, and it's a mistake to ignore the cultural meaning of an animal symbol. If we discard the animal symbology of the Middle Ages, we are neglecting the mentality of the time and we also misunderstand that same mentality which helps us to comprehend the cultural perceptions about animals and uh, their usefulness. But that's just it. With the shift from paganism to Christianity, any animistic notion in the religious panorama was left behind and animals often became religious symbols as analogies the, depicting struggles, sins, but also humor and no small amount of derogatory implications of the Christian political religious mentality and views. And animals also reduced to means of survival by the consumption of their meat with little regard for other aspects that once were very present within uh, animistic mentalities. Uh, not to mention that specific animals that often appear depicted in pre-Christian monuments and the stone carvings had a completely different meaning and their symbology and the religious uh, connotations have changed quite a lot with the introduction of uh, Christian religious and biblical themes which ha have changed the entire perception 
uh, we have of such religious symbolisms and we often fall into the mistake of understanding pagan subjects as a reflection of Christian religious themes. Such is the case of the serpent, for instance, as, as a quick example, which, archaeologically speaking, it is clearly noticeable that in a pagan mentality, and since we are talking about Scandinavia, let's not forget about the picture stones of Iron Age Gotland, well, the serpent was understood to be an animal of power and magic, usually related to the feminine divine and the power and ancestral wisdom of Chthonian deities. However, Christianity has changed such animal symbols and pagan religious connotations associated to them and turned the serpent into a symbol representative of evil, sin and the devil. This isn't solely a Christian religious theme, but uh, is in fact the serpent representing evil or a monster is a religious theme noticeable in some classical mythologies which were in fact compiled in a later period by Christians and this theme has, has entered into, into the medieval depictions of ancient pagan deities fighting serpents by turning old gods into saints and uh, the killing of the serpent as the symbolism of the triumph of Christianity over paganism. Some have pointed out that the theme of gods fighting and killing serpents is an ancient Indo-European myth, which is why we see it depicted in many pagan mythologies, even though such written sources concerning those mythologies were actually compiled by Christians. Gods fighting serpents isn't an Indo-European motif. In fact, it's an Indo-Iranian motif which has influenced Zoroastrianism and in turn influenced Judaism when Jewish populations went to exile in Babylonia and were under the governance of their new Persian rulers whose religion was Zoroastrianism. And the dualistic religious perceptions of good versus evil had a profound and ever everlasting effect on Jewish perceptions of evil which in turn influenced religions such as Christianity and other religious uh, movements and belief systems within the classical world. And thus, we finally have the depiction of pagan gods fighting serpents as a long-lasting representation of good versus evil from the part of Eastern monotheistic dualistic religious movements. The truth is, the Indo-Iranian motif of gods fighting serpents isn't actually a battle of good versus evil, but a religious motif with a fertility and sexual character, which was changed into a fight of good versus evil by Zoroastrianism, and from that moment onwards, the motif of gods fighting serpents changed and influenced later myths, most of which compiled by Christians who took the opportunity to repress pagan religious motifs of the feminine divine that was still very much active in Europe until the early Middle Ages in many geographical areas, including in Scandinavia, the Scandinavian Iron Age, and most of Western Europe. But this is something for another time. I just wanted you to understand that what we think we know about uh, animal symbolism isn't always what it seems and indeed we have to make the effort an extra effort to understand such symbolisms not uh, not according to a specific cultural geographical space in this case but according to the several religious manifestations through time that occur in the same geographical areas right this is one of the many reasons why studying medieval sources uh, that, that speak about pagan themes, uh, in this case Old Norse written sources, cannot be taken at face value as if such sources were accurate depictions of the pagan mentality. There may be some pagan themes in there, of course, obviously, but unfortunately greatly seasoned by religious mentalities in direct opposition to pagan religious themes, belief systems and cultic behavior. However, there is no denying that the Old Norse myths and other uh, literary uh, works are imbued with animal symbolisms, which is part of an animistic understanding of the pagan past that even though it was altered when such sources were written, they still contain important information in relation to the pagan mentality of the past, especially when Christian authors 
that compiled such sources go through a great length to underline evil aspects or simply purposely take out the religious and cultic connotations, leaving the accounts with several gaps, but also with loads of contradictions. So, indeed, there could have been uh, specific afterlife places where certain animals would go to or inhabit, but, as said before, when the sources were written down, it was already with a different religious mentality, uh, or better still, uh, a different worldview, in which animals were little more than food material or food uh, source or, or food stuff. So, whatever animistic perceptions animals may have had in pre-Christian Scandinavia, those notions are hardly perceptible and animals in Old Norse literature became solely religious symbolisms. But archaeology gives us more clues uh, than the literary sources, and animals buried alongside humans uh, may indeed reflect the mentality or the mentality of the past towards animals on a pre-Christian archaeological context, of course. Let's see. Um, I have already done uh, three videos, at least, about cats in Scandinavia, and uh, perhaps this might help you to understand the uh, pre-Christian Scandinavian religious panorama towards such animals. Uh, I'll leave uh, here on this right upper corner in the information icon the, the first video I did about cats, simply entitled The Viking Cats. However, uh, by the end of this video I'll leave two suggested videos which I think uh, they are important to understand the archaeological and the magical religious symbology of cats in Old Norse societies. Uh, and the videos are entitled Why Cats and Witches? A Norse Perspective and uh, the other one is about Freya, uh, cat cult and uh, fertility magic. Uh, please do watch those videos if you have the time, of course, and uh, I think it will be useful to understand at least the weight of cats in Old Norse societies. You see, cats were not native to Europe. Cats were brought by the Phoenicians uh, along the Mediterranean coast. The first Phoenician colonies date back to, the, to approximately the 1100s before the Common Era, progressively spreading throughout the Mediterranean from the Hellenic uh, world into the Italic Peninsula and finally the Iberian Peninsula. The latter, the colonies date back to the 7th century uh, before the Common Era. Cats were carried uh, in boats precisely to eat the mice on board. It is highly likely that Scandinavians did not pick up on the wide popula popularity of the domestic cat until they began to come in contact with other cultures during the Viking period. It is possible that Scandinavians have only shown interest in cats by coming in contact with the British Isles, where cats were used as pest control, just like in Mediterranean and Western European cultures. There are many pre-Christian Scandinavian traditions that have come from other cultures, as you know it, such as the tradition of placing money in the mouths of the dead, and the idea of caves being entrances to the underworld, uh, and so the tradition of the cat as a fertility symbol, as a fertility symbol, especially in relation to fertility goddesses, was also brought into Scandinavia at some point, probably during the Iron Age, uh, during the common era, during the migration period. Mind you that I'm talking about magical religious conceptions in relation to the cat and not the animal itself, right? This doesn't mean that cats did not exist in Scandinavia before the Viking period, obviously. Wild cats uh, subsisted in the post-glacial thermal period, but wild cats are not domesticated cats, obviously. The earliest evidences of domesticated cats, domesticated cats in Scandinavia come from the migration period of the Iron Age on the Swedish islands of Öland and Gotland, 6th century of the Common Era. But it was not until the 11th century that the cat became a common animal in Sweden, at least. The cat was used to hunt mice and rats, as well as for its skin. Throughout the Middle Ages, the pelt industries made a lot of use from cat skin and cat fur. But it is important to take notice that even before Scandinavians had domesticated cats, they 
already venerated felines during the Neolithic, judging by the archaeological findings of settlements dating back to that period in Scania, where wild cats were found buried in a pit covered with red ochre. So felines already had a certain importance in the religious panorama of Scandinavia, pre-Christian religious panorama of Scandinavia, at least since the Neolithic. But there's no telling what the spiritual perceptions in relation to this animal were. After the cat was progressively domesticated during the Iron Age, the close contact with the animal certainly has had a greater impact on the lives of pre-Christian Scandinavians. And it's in that moment that the religious perceptions towards cats might be a little bit clearer to us the Celts could have been an influence on the cat's position in the Old Norse religion. Celtic cultural influences were surely widespread all over Europe, but the Celts that shared the same uh, geographical area as the Germanic peoples of continental Europe certainly influenced Scandinavians precisely during the migration period. And there is no doubt that the Norse had close contact with the Celts judging by the Celtic influence in Norse art. Take the example of Keredwin, a Celtic cat goddess with many important similarities with Freya. Keredwin, like Freya, was also a shape changer as well as a dual deity of savagery and fertility. And perhaps it is in Iceland that we see a greater religious importance towards the cat. The Icelandic population was largely made of made up of, uh, of Norse Celtic mixture and we find cats skulls in uh, human burials deposited in pits not at random but clearly with the connection with the deceased. Cats in Iceland or back in homeland Scandinavia were not needed as pest manage management until much later in Scandinavian history. So it seems clear cats were brought to Iceland not with the sole purpose of pest control but as Pets. It's important to remember that the great majority of Icelandic settlers were actually members of the Norwegian nobility. And since domesticated cats were quite rare in Scandinavia, most cat owners were from the nobility. White cats, for instance, were especially rare and therefore costly. So only among the high social classes of Scandinavians such an animal would be a member of the family as a pet. Speaking of Freya, she was the only named Norse goddess from the fertility tribe of the Vanir, making her the, the, the fertility goddess. There were fertility celebrations to Freya that involved carts being pulled with the image of the goddess or with some symbolic representation of the goddess, and indeed such carts seemed to have played a large role in fertility symbolism. Freya, as the representation of the Mother Earth in specific cultic fertility rituals, would drive her cart bringing life to the land. As cats were understood to be symbols of fertility, it's only natural that in Norse myths Freya's cart was pulled by cats. And we also have the case of, of the tradition among farming communities in Scandinavia, uh, placing a pan of milk in, in the cornfields for Freya's cats as refreshment. The intention behind this, tradi this traditional folk magic is that Freya would be grateful for this offering to her cats and would protect the crops from foul weather or other calamities according to this folk belief, right? Freya was highly praised among the elite. In fact, Freya's name literally means lady, which can be read as a title, in this case a female title, indicating Freya's noble ties to Scandinavian queens and uh, women of noble birth. One of the gifts of Freya bestowed upon mortals is wise counsels granted through divination, and prophecies are shared through the human mouth, in the figure of the Cirrus, for instance. She is the, the link between mankind and the Vanir, or, or in this specific case, with Freya. The Cirrus would sometimes appear in the guise of Freya, at occasions coming into people's homes to conv convey the blessings of the goddess herself. The Cirrus would impersonate Freya, and the goddess would work through the human figure. 
It is important to remember that, indeed, most ceremonies were held by the nobility, and it was expected uh, from the king and queen to act on behalf of a deity. The queen, or another female member of the nobility, would take on the role as priestess queen, or, or simply priestess, being um, specifically priestesses of Freya, acting on behalf of the goddess, impersonating her, expressing her power and giving her power through the human figure that incorporated the goddess. Women are thought to have been heavily involved in sacrificing to fertility deities, and many of the fertility priestesses and priests uh, with, with certainty were of high or even royal birth. So the cat, as well as the dog, were animals of the elite. Since Freya is also a death goddess who presides over Furkavangar, the field of the host or army field, uh, which seems to have been an afterlife place not for the, the common warrior, but for the warrior of high or noble or even royal birth, such as Valhol, well, we can perhaps construct a link here between Freya and her cats in this afterlife place. Cats being of the nobility and Folkevanger being an afterlife place for the warrior elite, perhaps we can assume that domesticated cats of the nobility would accompany their owners into Folkevanger. Cats indeed appear in burials. The cats remain uh, specifically, specifically arranged and deposited alongside the deceased. So there is clearly an indication that the cat was meant to accompany the deceased into the afterlife. There are no clear indications to what afterlife place it would be, but since the sole connection of cats in Old Norse religion was with Freya, perhaps we can assume cats would go into Folkvangr, as said before. Uh, not any cat, however, but cats from nobility. The three videos I have previously mentioned might give more clues about the use of cats and their purposes in graves, and, of course, linked to Freya's fertility cult, witchcraft and sorcery. But on this specific aspect of an afterlife place for cats, it all points out to be Folkevanger, indeed. <laughs> Dogs have also been linked to nobility. In fact, in the cult of Odin, and I have a, an old video about it entitled The Cult of Odin, uh, but it's still relevant. <laughs> well, uh, we have evidences that dogs have been sacrificed as offerings to Odin and not solely as food resources. After everything that was said previously, perhaps we can immediately draw a picture of the afterlife place for dogs. If cats would go to the afterlife place for the warlike members of the nobility, dogs would go to a similar afterlife place, since dogs were also considered to be pets of the nobility. In Norse mythology, it is said that half of the warriors go with Freya to Folkvangor and the other half go with Odin to Valhall. Both afterlife places are otherworldly realms for dead warriors, but not the common warrior, however, but again, the warriors of high birth. If cats go with Freya, could dogs go with Odin into Valhall? Perhaps this is the picture we can immediately draw, judging by the dog sacrifices to Odin and the link between dogs, nobility and afterlife places for the nobility. It's not uncommon to find large animal bones in Viking Age sheep graves. For instance, eight large hounds have been found buried on both sides outside the, the, the long ship, uh, along with a, with a small dog placed inside the same long ship in the Goksta burial mound, dating approximately to 900 of the Common Era. The Goksta burial mound is a very complex burial mound from the perspective of its grand arrangement, its huge proportions and the great amount of material culture. There was a, a great effort to carry a long ship into the, the field and all its preparations and arrangements have likely to have moved a great group of people. It was without a doubt a costly funeral display. It's not a common person that was buried there, but someone of high birth. Either a king or, or at the very least a chieftain or a lord or a jarl. A, a warrior of nobility. So 
it was expected that this person would reach the afterlife according to its social class or social status, and that would either be Volkewanger or Valhol. Judging by the great amount of dogs, most likely the afterlife intended was some realm where Odin presided, since dogs were one of the most sacrificed animals to Odin. It's important to point out that the cult of Odin wasn't a widespread religious activity. The cult of Odin was reserved for the elite. Indeed, Odin was the god of the elite as well as the patron god of skulls, of poets, who performed precisely at courts, among the nobility. The great majority of poems evoke Odin precisely because he was the god of the elite and the poets performed for the elite. In fact, a poet in Scandinavia, a, a skald, lived off the patronage, patronage uh, from a wealthy lord. Please, uh, take a look at my video, uh, Importance of Poetry in the Viking Age, if you have the time, obviously, so we don't have to waste much time with me repeating myself again. So, the poet would often ev evoke Odin to please the wealthy lord. Contrary to what TV series, comic books, gaming and uh, general, uh, the general pop culture, Odin was not in fact a popular deity during the Viking period. He became far more popular in Nordic Christian medieval sources and since the 70s of the 20th century in some also through religious manifestations. Now, returning to the dogs in the Koksta burial mound, the eight large dogs were identified as being a sort of gaze hounds, which are breeds or types of hunting dogs that primarily hunt by sight and speed. So basically these dogs were hunting dogs and large in size. They were highly valued in the Viking Age society. Such large dogs were used in a considerable number to hunt big game, and according to the poem Rigstula, or Rigsmol, the lay of Rig, uh, which gives us a, precisely a description of the three main social classes of the Viking Age society and their lifestyle and uh, what they ate, it's precisely uh, the third social class, uh, nobility and or royalty, that has access to richer foods and allowed to hunt big game. So within Old Norse society, big game was only accessible to nobility, very much like in Anglo-Saxon England. And so it would be nobility that would possess the type of dogs breeds that would allow them to hunt big game. And when such dogs are found in a burial context, we can be certain it's a burial context for someone with high social status. But of course, uh, you may be asking, but what about the smaller dog inside the longship? To be inside the longship itself, in the area where the deceased was placed and served as the symbolic representation of the domestic environment, certainly this smaller dog would be the actual pet buried with its owner. While the larger dogs were for hunting and so they have been buried outside the longship, the smaller dog stayed within the longship with its owner, giving us clear indications of the animal's involvement in the domestic environment. In fact, it is curious to notice that, uh, for instance, in the Orke Inga saga, we can read about a small dog or a lap dog that the owner brought with him on travels overseas. On their last journey, uh, the owner and his dog were almost burned to death, but the owner managed to escape and took the dog with him. This is a good account, actually, of the friendship between a man and his small dog. Small dogs kept as pets. According to the Frosting law, the Frostenslovan, uh, Frostanting Slovan, uh, small dogs were highly valued, and if for some reason someone killed such a dog, they had to pay a fine equivalent to the price of a thrall, a slave, which was very expensive. The Fourth Athing law uh, is one of the oldest laws of Norway, dating back to the 13th century. It's by no means the oldest, but it's the one better preserved, and, and seems to um, not to be a particular set of laws made in the 13th century, but the same laws that had been around at least since the Viking period, possibly even earlier than that. In fact, the manuscript of the saga of the Orkneys dates back to the 13th century as well. It is a, a saga written during the 13th century, as most of Old Norse literature was written during that period. But it is an account that belonged to the oral tradition 
long before it has been put to parchment, which gives us the, the importance of small dog uh, of, or of small dogs as pets, as we can see by the 10th century case of the Goksta burial mound. This is by no means the only elaborate and rich burial mound of the Viking Age that contains dogs, obviously. Four dogs have also been found in the Osberg sheep burial, along with a variety of other animals and a cat. And the person to whom the Osberg sheep burial was constructed for was a woman of high birth, quite possibly priestess or priestess queen or wife of a wealthy chieftain, and her position would have also been linked to the duty of performing the religious ceremonies, and she might have took on the role of impersonating the goddess Freya in religious ceremonies of fertility, judging by the amount of material culture linked with the practice of Seidre, or, or, or rather the, the similar material culture also found in graves of Nordic Cirrhus, the, the Volur, prophetesses. If dogs were also linked to nobility, would that mean that the first Icelandic settlers also brought with them dogs as they have brought cats? Yes, indeed. The early Icelandic settlers brought dogs with them when um, they colonized Iceland, as early as the 9th century. Archaeological findings and the, the Viking sagas show that the dog had a great value among Scandinavians of the Viking period and the Middle Ages. And indeed, being animals linked to members of the Scandinavian society with high social status. But what would have been their afterlife place within the Scandinavian pre-Christian pagan mentality and religious beliefs? Well, possibly the same destination of cats and other animals linked to nobility. Some afterlife place reserved for the high social classes, either Folkevangr, Valhol, or maybe even Valoskjörf. Uh, the latter, uh, judging by the term Val, always in relation to the dead or the slain, and said to be one of Odin's holds. In fact, uh, it's Snorri Sturluson in the prose ad that says that Valoskjolf uh, was one of Odin's holds. Aside from this source, Valoskjolf is also mentioned in Grimnismal, which can be read in the poetic ad, <laughs> and it doesn't say anything about being Odin's holds, but rather a place of the gods which I quote in here. A third home is there with silver touched by the hands of the gracious gods, Valoskjolf, is it in days of old, set by a god for himself. Valoskjolf could well be the whole of another god praised by the warriors of high birth or the warlike nobility, since it seems to have been another whole for the slain. I would point to the god Tuir, who not only was a god related to war, but also to justice, and dogs had their place in Viking Age laws, as we have seen previously. Indeed, most of the evidences we have concerning dogs and cats in Old Norse society is from the perspective of social groups with high social status or a um, considerable position within the Old Norse society, because they were the wealthy ones and thus the ones with greater possessions and power to have more complex burial contexts which have survived to our days and gives us a lot more of information. In most contexts, it's clear that the presence of animals in human graves isn't a case of uh, the animal having died of natural causes, but actually sacrificed to accompany the deceased. And yes, even the ones considered pets, especially those. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed today's video and I hope you have found it useful. I had other plans for the two last videos of this month, but I decided to change uh, the subjects uh, as the videos I had planned required a, a little bit more time for research because, well, I, I want to deliver a proper information. So those have to wait. I'm sorry. So, well, my apologies <laughs> to my patrons who always know beforehand that the videos that will come uh, into this channel. Uh, but no worries, uh, the original videos I had planned will still come out at some point. Now, thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video, and as always, Tak Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje.